Raising a God-honoring family in the Psalm 2 generation. I want to look at Matthew 19, 1 to 6. We have Psalm 2 in our background. We read that together. We'll be looking at some other passages of Scripture as well. I would ask you to find in your Bible Matthew 19, verses 1 to 6. If you don't have a Bible, we're going to put the text on the screen for you, but please seek me out. We want to put a Bible in your hand. You need your own Bible. You need your own Bible to read for yourself, to read during the week. I, I shudder at the thought that for some of you walking in here, looking at the text on the screen, may be the only time you engage the Scripture during the week. I, if, if I ate that way, I would shrivel up to nothing and die. I hope you found it in your Bible. Let's stand together. I want you to follow along as I read. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. What have we just read together? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And how we need to lay hold of this Word and have it lay hold of our hearts and minds today. If we do not, families, then our children, our grandchildren will be swept away in a tide, a cesspool, uh, that, will, that will ruin the coming generations. We have to hope in God. Stand for God. Fight the fight of faith in a Psalm 2 generation. Thank you. Please be seated. Now, I want to be, I, I want to be uh, discreet in this. I'm, I'm keenly aware of the, of the audience we have here. But I don't, I'm, I'm fighting a balance here today. I don't want to water down but I'm going to change some language just to make it more appropriate language in, in this setting. I hope, I hope you'll find it that way. Did you ever think in your life, I mean, let's go back a year, two years, five years, ten years, did you ever think you would live to see a battle over who, which sex goes in which restroom or locker room or shower? I mean, did, did it... Were you, have you ever, were you sitting around one time contemplating and say, boy, I tell you what, it's going to be really strange when we face this. I did not. I did not. The Charlotte, North Carolina Observer. I think this was, I think this was May 20th. Girls need to get over the discomfort they feel at seeing male private parts in the locker room, the editorial board of one of North Carolina's largest newspapers wrote in a piece supporting the Obama administration's transgender school facilities edict. Now, if you don't know what that's talking about, if you've missed this somehow in the news, the Obama administration sent out a non-binding directive to all public schools at every level kindergarten all the way through college, post-college, any, any entity that receives federal funds that they are not to discriminate, they're to let anyone go into any restroom, locker room, shower, that he or she, on the basis of how he or she self-identifies. Gender identity is the buzz term. Now, with this non-binding directive was the following that that if you fail to do this, you will face lawsuits by the Department of Justice and you will lose federal funding from the Department of Education. Sounds pretty non-binding, doesn't it? The article goes on to say, yes, the thought of male private parts in girls' locker rooms and vice versa might be distressing to some, 
But the battle for equality has always been in part about overcoming discomfort. Now watch what... They're equating this, this perverse uh, movement. It's always been a part of, about overcoming discomfort with blacks sharing facilities, with gays sharing marriage, then realizing that it was not nearly so awful as some people imagine. There are civil rights leaders, if, you, if you're doing any reading on this at all, they are absolutely outraged that this movement could be linked to the civil rights movement where they, and there's an excellent portion in an article I read, and I won't take time to read it, but I mean this civil rights leader comes out and says, I, I'm incensed that you would link that, link this to, to our struggle be able to eat uh, in restaurants so you can understand that. One fellow wrote to the Charlotte Observer and the Obama administration, teenage girls being exposed to the sight of male private parts is something to be overcome. In this lunatic world, we place the burden of transgender progress on young girls, telling them to just get over it. To that, we answer no, absolutely no. Under God, no. We are called by God to be salt and light in a crooked and perverse generation. And in doing that, we are never called by God to serve our children up on the altar of the latest perversion that society is trying to advance. What we're going to have to learn to do, brothers and sisters, those of us who, who, who have the armor of God, are going to have to stand firm, stand fast, having done all to stand, stand lovingly, stand compassionately. This movement is, is driven by people with sinister agendas, but it's also swept up people who are victims in it, and we need to reach out to them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is their only hope. We sang about it today. It's, it's the only hope for sinners. And understand this when I'm talking today. I do not, no, no one knows his heart like he thinks he does. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, the Scripture says. Who can know it? But I know this, that if I do not keep the oil of grace poured on the tinder box that is my heart, where if I stop doing that, a match thrown on that kindling would set a blaze, that I, I could be guilty. Here's the deal. Don't hear me saying today, how could people do that? I could be guilty of anything you can imagine and worse than you can imagine. So we understand that. We're not addressing this from a position of superiority. We're addressing it really from a position of grief that we've come to this point and that our children now must be subjected to the, to the perverse whims of less than three-tenths of one percent of the population. Now, again, I, I've been preparing this for a while. And I came across two days ago, John Piper's, he was asked about this. Would you go into a Target, if you've read about Target's policy, a Target store restroom knowing their transgender policy? He was asked that. I want, you, I want to read a portion of his answer. This is, Piper has hit upon something that is very important for us to understand. He said, the first thing that comes to my mind when I hear that question is how parents are going to train their children in a culture where profound evil and deep corruption and God-ignoring perversion is pervasive and accepted and defended and assumed and destigmatized and statistically normal. I, I love Piper. He has such a capacity to, to put it right there in front of you. He said, that, that is so front burner for me. What's front burner? How, how will parents train their children in such a culture? He talks about how we grew up in different patterns. Here's part, he says, part of the answer to that question is whether we have a big enough doctrine of human depravity. He's absolutely right. When you lose the doctrine of human depravity, that man is by nature 
depraved. He is, he is, he is, uh, he's depraved. Uh, and he's darkened in his in his thinking. The scripture says the uh, the carnal mind is enmity toward God. He's darkened in his affections. He will not seek after the things of God. He says, are we able to take our children to the Scriptures and explain to them in terms that are shocking enough where the evils of our society are coming from? It's important to understand, it's not, it's not coming from Washington, D.C. It's, it's coming from the heart of depraved people. Which, by the way, if we're saved by grace, we were depraved people at one time. He said the children are going to be told by the Supreme Court and by their teachers and by their friends that the world has a different way, that, that the words, and here's, here's what I want you to keep on, of Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy are true. And he cites this statement in a 1992, 1992 now, that's not recent, a 1992 Supreme Court decision where Justice Anthony Kennedy wrote part of the decision. It was a religious liberty discussion. Here it is. Quote, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, and of the mystery of human life. It's the right to define one's own concept. Now, the fancy word for that is autonomy. In fact, this is hyper-autonomy. This is Psalm 2. The heathen rage, the people plot in vain. They take counsel together against the Lord and against His Messiah, His Christ, saying, let us break their band. We will not have this one to rule. Oh, God will not tell us who we are, where we come from, how we identify, and how we're supposed to act. Supreme Court Justice, 1992. And Piper makes the observation in, in, this, in his discussion that, it, that this threw the door open. Pandora's box was opened. Roe v. Wade, 1973, was awful. And, 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 and blood runs in the streets of our communities now because of abortion on demand. But this, that you get to define... See, the, con the conflict is between autonomy, which is simply the Greek autos nomos, self-law, or theonomy, theos nomos, God-law. There's the clash. And now this notion of getting to define, ex exercising the so-called right to define one's own concept of existence, of meaning, of the universe, of the mystery of human life, has set in motion. We, we have sown the wind. We are now reaping the whirlwind. He says, the second thing that comes to my mind is just to make sure that we have our terminology right. So Target has now put in place a policy, and it, and it goes like this. It aims to give freedom to, quote, transgender team members and guests to use the restroom of fitting. You've, you've read it. You've read it. So the new term is gender identity. The new code word, gender. He says, now used not for biological reality of maleness or femaleness, but for desired identity of so-called male or so-called female, even if the biological reality is the opposite of the desired identity. So gender identity can mean a male declaring himself to be female, a female declaring herself to be male. And he says this is simply the most recent act working out the principle that the Supreme Court established in 1992. So, that little bit of background. I want us to look at this passage today and companion passages. I want us to see from Matthew 19 two things, and then we're going to add a third from Ephesians 5 and 6. First of all, in Matthew 19, a tricky question from the Pharisees. Secondly, Jesus' answer regarding the sovereign prerogative of the Creator. And then third, we'll look at the sovereign Creator's design for the family. So let's, let's just look at, at Matthew 19. There's a reason I picked it, and we're, you're going to see that in a minute. This tricky question in verse 3, you, you know the background, verses 1 and 2, where he's traveling and he's, he's healing. The Pharisees come to him, and by the way, folks, if you haven't understood this yet in the New Testament, when the Pharisees come to him, 
except maybe when Nicodemus came to him at night, and when, when, when Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea come to take the body down. Pretty much every other time, when the Pharisees come to him, it's a trap. It's a trap. And they come with this question. It's, it's a trick. Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? That is not the original intent. If you, if you know, we've looked at this before. This is not a message on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, but we've looked at it before. Moses uh, allowed a, a bill of divorcement, it was called, because of the hardness of the hearts of people, and it really was to protect the woman who could be put out for any reason. The law didn't teach that. It was just, it was just developed culturally. It's interesting. You don't, you don't hear the Pharisees asking, is it, is it right, is it lawful f- to divorce one's husband for any cause? And that's how they, they, were just, they, were, they weren't thinking that way. A wife in that culture was just a little more than, than chattel. I mean, she was a little more than a possession. There's the question. They want to trick you. They want to see, what, what are you going to do? You're going to say, no? Well, then, haven't, aren't you then flying in the face of tradition, of centuries of tradition that's built up along around this bill of divorcement? And if you say yes, you then, aren't you part of the problem? You're not part of the solution. Here's his answer. Now, oftentimes, you should know this about Jesus. He answers a question no one was asking. Because it's, it's not about what a man can do. It's about what the Creator intends. Have you not read? Now, by the way, you want to insult a Pharisee? I mean, you want to just hit him upside the head? But, see, the Pharisees had to memorize the Old Testament, the Tanakh, the Law of the Prophets, in the, in the writings. Part of, their, part of their getting into being a Pharisee. Have you not read? <laughs> Aren't you aware? Insult. That he who created them from the beginning made them male and female. The Creator's original design, his original intention, after he had created everything and at the end of every day said, he saw what he created and said, This is good. This is good. This is good. He created male and female. He made Adam. We've looked at this before. We've studied this before. I'm not going to go through all that again, but you just need to remember. He took Adam, Adam. Ish, he was called originally. All right. From the dust of the ground, which is what Adam means. And he molded a, a man, a male. And he breathed into his nostrils. He, he ruached. The word in the Hebrew for breathe. The breath. The same word, by the way, we told you recently for spirit. The ruach was hovering over the face of the deep. He breathed into the nostrils of Adam. The breath of life. And, and Adam became a living nephesh. He became a living soul. He had all the animals pass in front. And Adam named them. That's, that just wrap your mind around that for a minute. Adam named the entire animal species. So all these things that you find out that, that, that uh, these animal experts discover, Adam named it. They just figured it out. Didn't they? Adam had already named it. Then God says it's not good for the man to be alone. The point, the point of Adam naming them was to demonstrate his mental capacity that they're, they're to have He's to have authority over all of of the garden, which God told him. But it was also to to convince Adam there was not in the animal kingdom anything that could match him or meet him or complement him. It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a help meet suitable for him. Caused Adam to fall asleep. You remember the story? He took a rib out of Adam's side. As the commentators have said through the years, he didn't take a bone out of his head so that the woman would, would, would try to uh, be over him. Didn't take a bone out of his foot so the woman would be his doormat. Took a bone out of his rib so she would be by his side. All right? He, and so he brought her to the man and he said, oh, this is, this is wonderful. She's bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. In the beginning, he who created the creator. Now, understand, you've got to realize if you're, if you're in this discussion, 
one of the big things that's been, that's been hammered and bashed against for years are the first 11 chapters of Genesis because if the left, if the, if the so-called progressives, uh, if, if they can convince people, the population, that Genesis 1 through 11 is a myth, then this is just a story. It's just a fable. But it's history. Jesus cites it as history in our passage in Matthew 9. Have you not read that he who created them in the beginning made them male and female? What has that got to do with their question about divorce? Well, he goes on to say what, what marriage means. A man leaves his father and his mother. He, he, he now uh, is, is, is a man in his own right. He cleaves to his wife, holds fast. He holds fast here, guys. We're going to look at this a little bit in 1 Peter 3. In the coming week. Not here. He doesn't hold, grab her on the throat. That's not where you hold fast. You hold fast. You cling to your wife. You love her. You, you draw her near to you compassionately because, because she, uh, she's a weaker vessel and a joint heir of Christ. And, and that, that means a lot. Every, look, every Christian woman I know, and I've, I've counseled for 40 years now, every Christian woman I know would die to have a man who would lovingly lead her. You want your wife to follow you? Lovingly lead her. All right, so they are no, no longer two but one flesh. So here's, he's finally getting back to their, what God has put, joined together, let not man put us under, let not man separate. So his answer finally is, why would you be, why would you be, so, in other words, why not be pro-marriage? Why are you wanting to be sure that, that we've got all the, all the uh, exceptions available so that we can have a divorce? It's wrong thinking again on the part of the Pharisees. But the key that I want you to see today, he who made them from the beginning made them male and female. Look real quickly at Genesis 1, 26, 28, where this comes up. God said, let us make man in our image. That's, that's Elohim, the plural name for God. Who, who is us? It's not, it's not God in the... And the angels, it's, it's, it's the Trinity, whom we would come to know as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This one God in three persons says, let us make man in our image. The imago Dei, the image of God. You, you see, we, we don't get to self-identify. We don't get the right to determine because we are made in the image of God. He's the designer. He's the owner. What, so what does the instruction manual say about us having been made by him? And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over and every other creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He just walked us through the sequence. Hadn't he? God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Stop. We've discussed this before. We're just going to mention it. This is, this is, uh, we, we love lesbian women and want to reach out to them and help them. Point them to a better way. We love homosexual men. We want to reach out and love them. But there's no way the two homosexual men, two lesbian women can accomplish this, this mandate. Be fruitful and multiply. You say, well, what about in vitro fertilization? No, no, no. That's not what God's talking about here. And fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea. You see, why can they not do Because they cannot subdue their own passions. There's no way they can subdue the earth. Bring it under the, under the headship and the lordship of God. You know, et cetera, et cetera. Genesis 5, 1 to 2, it comes up again. It's a, it's a brief restatement of creation. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them. And he blessed them and named them Mankind. When they were created. Now, what's the point of all this? If it had been okay to self-identify, to go through gender changes and all this, then there would have been an et cetera in here somewhere. Made them male, female, and, and other things that might develop. No, no. It's very definitive, very clear. And so, for this principle that Anthony Kennedy said, to hold liberty is the right to define one's own existence. And that's the clash. That's where the, that's where the battle is. God has to be excluded from the picture because it means to be God 
is that God defines us for us. The devil did it in the garden. He's doing it right now today to men and women. Is that really what God said? Yea, hath God said. God gets to design and, and determine the definition of our existence. So the third thing I want you to see. How, how then do we raise God honoring families in a Psalm 2 generation? Well, we look at if, if, we, if we buy into, and we, as evangelicals, we better buy into the fact that God is the one who made us. He's the one who designed us. He's the one who set the boundaries. We go that far and no farther. Male and female was all that was in the mind of God. It's all that's in the mind of God right now. Not only when he created, but as he, as he sustains. Any uh, mutation of that is unacceptable to God. It's sin. No worse than my sins, except the consequences are huge. Look at his design. Ephesians 5, you know the passage. We've studied this before too, so I want you to just look over it with me today and think, put the lenses of the gender identity argument and the challenge we have of raising a family in this culture that's going to get greater and greater, by the way. Wives, it addresses wives, husbands, children, parents. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Wives, if your husband's mistreating you, come see us. We want to talk about that. We want, we want to set that right in this congregation. Don't go to the world. Don't take up the weapons of the world if you're being mistreated by your husband. You, you, you point a beautiful picture of the glory of womanhood when you submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Now, Husbands, that means the, the Lord's not harsh with us. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body and himself the Savior. As the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And, and Colossians is a companion passage to this. And, it, and it's so, so it's not teaching us here, we've gone through this before, that, that the wife has no recourse, that the husband's able to say and do anything he wants to do, and the wife just has to grin and bear it. That is not biblical teaching on submission. Husbands, verse 25, love your wives. Now, verse 22, 20, 23, 24 covers the challenge to the wives. If you're going to raise God-honoring families, then, then, it's, then the homes have to, have to have, if they have a wife in them, have to have a wife with this heart and this disposition. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That is, that is more of a mouthful than submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. I'm going to say something parenthetical here. A lot of these boys and girls who are growing up as young men and women that are confused about their gender identity, grew up in homes where there either was no dad or where the dad was so undad-like that these children have gone through a rejection of the God-ordained relationships, male and female. Dads did not lead them. One of the reasons we've passed out this book is I want to challenge you to have family worship in your home. It's not happening. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to put you on a guilt trip. I'm just saying that, that dads, husbands, you have a hothouse that's cultivating something. And for those of us who are grandparents, get the word out to our kids. You've got, you've got to engage in this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her. That is, he, he has a cleansing effect. He doesn't save her, but a saved wife is sanctified by the relationship she has to her husband. Here's the question. Do you as a husband draw your wife nearer to God, or does your conduct and your activity push her away from God? Cleansing her by the washing of water with the word, the, the cleansing power of the word of God. So that he might present the church, Christ did this, to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. You see, when, when, as husbands, we want to point out the blemishes in our wives. The scripture says you better go look in the mirror to find the blemisher. In the same way, husbands should love their own wives as their own bodies. 
These are these words. We went through them, studying through Ephesians, and I mean, they just bring you to your knees when you take them seriously. He who loves his wife loves himself. You're, you're taking care. And that's true, by the way. You love your wife the way the Scripture calls you to love her, and, and guess what? You, you have a help meet that will follow you to the ends of the earth to, to support you and encourage you and bless you. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. You know the passage. He cites the Genesis 2, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and become one flesh. And here he says this. This is a profound mystery. And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. There is no way, there is no way in the whole transgender movement, the gender identity movement, that relationships can be brought together that reflect Jesus Christ and the church. There's only one relationship that does that. A wife who loves Jesus in the gospel, been saved by grace through faith, who shows that to her husband. And a husband who loves Jesus and shows a wife in his working things out imperfectly the love of Jesus. And in that setting, children get to see something of the mystery of Christ's love for the church. And there's, folks, there's no other arrangement or relationship that shows that. None. If, you, if you're looking and reading this material today, there, 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 are these, there are these graphics, these, these images, these icons, and it just strings out for 10, 15, 20 different gender identities. I'm not angry about it. I'm broken hearted about it. Then in chapter 6, well, he says, verse 33, let each one of you love his wife as himself. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. There's a great study by the Egler, I can't ever pronounce their name, Egleriches, or Egg, Egg Riches. It's, anyway, love and respect. And it's a great read. It's a great study where when they talk about in communication, when, when the communication is going bad, the wife can say, that felt unloving. Was I being disrespectful? And the husband can say, that, that felt disrespectful. Was I being unloving? Love and respect. Chapter 6. Children, obey your parents. Place yourself under them to listen to them with a view and ear to following them in the Lord, for this is right. Children should not be subjected by parents who, who demand this and are not leading them in the Lord. Honor your father and your mother. The fifth commandment, the law of God is brought into play here. This is the first commandment with a promise. Parenthetically, let me say that William Blackstone, who wrote the commentaries on the law, was an English jurist who rose to prominence, taught at Oxford, and a law professor. His four-volume commentaries on the law were a standard set that if you were going to go into law school in the United States of America, you had to read Blackstone's commentaries on the law. And he says, no law should be considered law if it does not match the law of the Creator. And he cited the Ten Commandments. No law should be considered law if it does not line up with, flow out of the Ten Commandments of the Creator. It's a great study to undertake sometime. Honor father and mother, the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you that you may live long in the land. Parenthetically, parents, we need to be honorable before our children. We need to have honorable lives so that they're honoring us. It's, it, it's going to be challenging because our children are little sinners who grow up to be big sinners. They, it's going to be challenging, but if we are living honorable lives before them, we take away some of the brunt of that, some of the, some of the pain of that. And then fathers, parents, do not provoke your children to anger. Oh, dads. Gosh, when I read this, I want to go back, and I can't go back. I'm going to go back to the, to the younger days of my parenting. And if you ask me, do you discipline your children? Go oh, by, I discipline my children, yeah. But see, what I had to harness under by grace was that when you discipline your children in anger, you provoke them to anger. We're disallowed that. God our Father chastens us 
But he never does it to get a pound of flesh for our misconduct. He chastens his children because he loves us. He wants to keep us between the rails of his law and not go off the rails. It is for our good. Fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The battle, folks, the battle is fought and won or lost in the home. We're either, we're either raising up children who will be fodder for the latest perversion this culture brings or we are raising up warriors who will be arrows that will pierce the darkness of this culture. There's, this is serious business. We don't have time as parents to think it's about us. It's not about us. It's, the, it's about the glory of God inculcated, shown to our children. The battle is won and lost also in the pulpits of America. We've blown it. We've blown it. We've either been silent about some of these things and just let them go on and, and put, let people take our silence to mean approval, or we have, been, we have been harsh and unbiblical about them, and it comes across as being judgmental and pharisaic, and, and it's written off, it's discounted. We have got to get a clear sound here, and pray for a clear sound in every pulpit to hold the biblical line, the gospel line, that, that this movement is just the latest movement away from God and the path back to God is the same as it's always been. That's the repentance of sin, faith in Christ, trusting in Him and the gospel, being brought from death to life. And here's, I don't know how much longer I have on this earth, but a lot of you are younger than me. Here's what the church faces. The salvation of transsexuals, of transgender and confused gender, as people come to faith in Christ, and we will have to shepherd them through and nurture them through because somebody marketed in their soul for their political agenda. That's what we face. If we're going to be salt and light, if we're going to be on mission for God, so, Piper's admonition to us. We should spend most of our creative energies on constructing in our minds and in our hearts and in our families a great and beautiful and glorious alternative version of reality than the ones we are being offered by the world. If we give most of our time, which we do not do here, we will not do here, to bemoaning and criticizing the world for acting like the world, our vision of God and His glorious future for His people will become smaller and smaller. And that could be a great tragedy, greater tragedy than the one we're facing now. We must live intentionally for Jesus Christ in every arena. We, not, we must not be silent when it comes up in your, in your world sphere. But look and say, my Creator made us male and female. That was enough for Him. It's enough for me. Anything beyond that is rebellion that is fraught with so much difficulty. It's not freedom. It's all done in the name of it. It's not freedom. It is bondage of the worst type. And then say, but there is a way. The same way that rescued me the way that rescues any who repent of sin and trust in Jesus Christ. Be clear. Be lovingly firm. But compassionately offer the remedy. The world, simply acting like the world. I close with this. This, this country was founded on Judeo-Christian principles and to show you the staying power of those principles... The, the foundations have continued to hold even in the face of just an intentional wholesale abandonment of them. And now the foundations are cracking. The resilience of Judeo-Christian worldview taken from the Scripture 
is crumbling. The scripture says, if the foundations are destroyed, what shall the righteous do? The righteous shall do what we always do. Look to God. Hope in God. Understand that God has blessed us to be a blessing to the neighborhoods around us and the nations. He's blessed us to be a blessing to the transgender movement, to the gender identity movement. Piper answers the question, by the way, would you go into it? He said, I would not as a matter of conscience. I would not. Others may try to fit in. We cannot. We must not. We stand firmly, lovingly on the gospel of Jesus Christ and let people make no mistake about why we stand where we stand. Because we serve and love a crucified and risen Savior who is able to save us to the uttermost. And save us from what Paul would say to the Corinthians, such were some of you, but you were washed. Parents, talk to your children about this as it comes up. Let them know that the Scripture answers this clearly. And we have confidence in God and in His Word so that we will not be moved if we stand upon that unshakable foundation of Christ. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have made a mess of Your world. And we, the church, repent of that. You've called us to be salt and light and, and clearly it's not happening as it should. So we repent, Lord. I ask You to forgive us. Help us, help us start at the very foundation in our own lives submitted to, to the Lordship of our Savior, being increasingly transformed to the image of Christ, and then in those relationships you give us to speak truth and love into those relationships, particularly those primary ones in our home, to raise children in the discipline and, and, and nurture of the Lord. We pray that you will save our children, our grandchildren, Oh God, save them by your grace. Give them, give them north on the compass. Help us to, to address the biblical view of sin. Not go soft on it. And Lord, give us the desires of our hearts. That we will live to have an impact on the culture around us. I, Lord, I pray. I pray for these brothers and sisters here who may have relatives that have gone into this, who may have neighbors, who are co-workers. I pray, dear God, that you will bless these brothers and sisters and that we will see people lost in this movement brought savingly to faith in Christ and among us as our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray for our leaders, Lord. They need a good dose of salvation. Oh, save them, Father. Save them. We look to you. Help us be found faithful until Jesus comes. But we ask it in his name. Amen.